Now, Susie, what do you think of your treasure box? I absolutely love it. I love all the woods and the beautiful carved shell. I should have made it smaller, just saying. Stay with us. <laughs> Learn how to make your own today on the American Woodshop. The American Woodshop with Scott Phillips is brought to you by... Woodcraft, since 1928. Providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Pro Tools. For tool pros. Rikon Tools. Woodcraft Magazine. Projects, plans, and web links designed to help you make wood work. P.S. Wood, home of Timberwolf Swedish Silicon Steel bandsaw blades and super sharp scroll saw blades. A bed to sleep on. A table to share meals. A house that feels like a home. The Furniture Bank of Central Ohio. Providing furniture to neighbors in need. Everyone needs their own treasure box. Well, it just so happens she married a man who can do that. That's right. Okay, well, <laughs> let's get to it, and you need to come back to share finishing tips. So I will. over to the miter saw we go. On every box, there are six surfaces, the bottom, the top, and the four sides. For the sides and the ends, we're using Aripari, and it's a wood from South America, and it's beautiful, and this one has some spalding in it, so... We have that laid out. And then for the front and the back, it's just butternut, plain to half inch thickness. Now, the lid is one and an eighth inch thick because we're going to scallop that out with hand planes. And this is solid, genuine mahogany. So I have my layout marks done. Now, word about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the instructions that come with the tools and products you use in your wood shop. Work safely. So I'll get my hearing protection on, safety glasses always, dust collection, that's important, especially with mahogany. And I'll make a series of cross cuts to get those warp pieces. And it's important to let that come to a complete stop for a perfect cut like that. Get this done, then it's out the router table. We're outside to do all the routing because even with dust collection on a good router table like this, and this is a bench top that I like with a two horsepower router, spiral up cut, three eighths inch bit, solid carbide. And what I'm going to do, I've selected the best face is up. So that's facing up. I'm using a miter gauge to do these short grain or the end cuts first, and you'll see why this fence is important in just a second. And mahogany, any wood that's resistant to decay, you definitely want to be wearing an N95 dust mask, even with dust collection. So let me make the first couple of cuts, and I use an excellent push block to hold it down and to the table and against the fence. And when you start it up, well away from the bit, I'll make the first pass. And I'll rotate it around, 180. Make the second pass, like so. Always keeping my hand on the miter gauge. That way, it's safe and away from the bit. So you see these two cross cuts made. Now, next, I'll use the push block to make the same type of cuts against the fence through the long running grain. We'll do the other side now. That looks good. Now turn that off. And this will fit the inside of the box perfectly. I know because I've already measured that out. Now what I can do is move the fence in to clean up the rest of that shoulder. And I just want it so that 
it graces the back side of that bit. Doesn't have to be square to the bit because the bit will end up centering it right here on the board. So let's make these cuts. Again, I want to do the cross cuts first. That way the long cuts will clean up any tear out. Just like that. That's perfect. And I'll do this all the way around. And once that's done, we'll be able to use the jig to cut all the box joints. Looking good. So that's how the bottom's channeled on all four sides. And now you can see how that will fit on the walls of the box once the box is made. Now these are called finger joints or box joints and they're all 3 eighths of an inch. And keep that in mind because at 3 eighths of an inch, everything is set up using this plywood jig. Now if you look right here on top of the router table, this is a quarter inch piece of plywood it has a 3 8 inch square, and it has to be precise, waxed piece of wood glued to it. And right here, that 3 8 inch bit is offset from the fence by 3 8 of an inch. That's what the thickness of this board is. And it's clamped securely so that it holds that position. Now what I do is I use this jig that I made by just creating a right angle. I got fancy, I dovetailed it, and then I cut the grooves like you're going to see me cut the assembly. Very simple jig to make. And those 3 8 inch cuts fit right onto that 3 8 inch fence or rail. Wax is key here, so it glides effortlessly. Now, what I'm going to do is take the long pieces, and that's the butternut for the front and back and butt it up against that 3 8 inch piece. Then I'm going to take this spacer board, bring up the, plot, the uh, end pieces, the short pieces, and I make sure that all four of these pieces are pushed securely. These back two against the rail, and these front two against the spacer board. And then, without moving anything, keeping everything square, I'm going to clamp this very carefully, just like so. And I want to make sure it stays tight against the fence. And that looks really good. I'm going to check the long pieces as well. Looks great. Now, safety gear up and on. And we're going to make a series of cuts, gliding them all the way through. The bit's up half an inch, and that's OK, because this is a two horsepower motor with a heavy-duty spiral upcut carbide cutter. So now we're ready to make those cuts. Now, that's secured. Always use two clamps so nothing slips as you make those passes. That looks good right there. And keep your hands on top, safely away from everything. Let's make those cuts. out and now what I can do is lift it up and I'll show you the channel now it lines straight up a little bit of fuzz on that edge no harm no foul and so I move it into the cut I just made up on the fence and I repeat that process until I'm all the way through to the other side
let that bit come to a complete stop. And here's what we have. Take this apart. This is always fun. And the cool thing is, you do two corners at one time. So I'll take that off, like that. And naturally, there's going to be a little bit of fuzz on these 3 8 inch joints because of the nature of the wood that you're working with here. And you can see I've already started a shell carving here. And I'll show you how to make that easily in about three hours. You'll see it in two minutes, but I'll give you the tips on how you can hand cut that. But here is the one thing that you're going to find. See that little tab on this side? That means I was off less than a 64th of an inch. That's no big deal. I can use a hand plane to tune up those boards. But that's how you create perfect box joints or finger joints. You can't beat it. Now I'll repeat the same process by stacking it up and cutting the other ends. And then it's inside to cut the channel on a router table with a quarter inch cutter that the bottom will go in and then we can do some carving. We'll get that set up. Let that come to a complete stop. And that is what is called a stop cut. Still spinning down. There we go. And what that does, it creates the groove in the bottom of the box that will accept the bottom. And this groove couldn't go all the way through because it would be seen on the end of the finger of the box joint. So let me show you what happens when you marry these two pieces together, like so, that completes a continuous channel all the way around so that we can now join the entire box together. But before we do that, it's a million times easier to carve this shell now. Let's go carve the shell. Now these are called chip carving knives. That's uh, from Wayne Barton, who has written all the books, and he's the best at chip carving design that ever was, ever will be. Thank you, Wayne. And long ago, Wayne helped me design this shell, and he carved the first one, and I've carved a dozen or more since then. But it all started with the Goddard Townsend School of Furniture Making out in Newport, Rhode Island, with the scallop shell, which is what this represents centuries ago. And then, of course, I've come up with my own pattern, and then I've even tried it on CNC, but you can't beat the simplicity of chip carving. Now, I'm going to use sharpening stones, and what you do to keep it sharp, because that's key, this is a ceramic stone. You lock your wrist when that bevel is just right, and in tight circular motions, you bring that edge right up, and I'm doing the other side. The key is you don't want to crown or round over the bevel because you, it's impossible to get a good edge. Now I'm using an 8,000 Norton hard stone, and these get cuffed out even though they're hard over time, so you have to keep them flat. You gotta dress them flat. And without honing, the knife will not be sharp and that's got a keen edge on it right there. That's important. This tiny little chip carving knife is excellent when you have to go deep. Now let me show you the cuts. These are called chip cuts for a reason, and I do the stop cuts first, and the key is holding the knife just like that at an angle. Let me see if I can get in position so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And you don't draw the knife towards you, you move your entire hand with it. You aren't in trouble that way. Now watch. I'm holding the same angle, and, and that angle's about 40 degrees, and I have to go to the bottom of that cut right there, and I'm working with this butternut. Basswood works well too, but butternut 
has a wonderful grain to it. So I want it nice and deep right there. And I need to make one more cut holding that 40 degree angle to go nice and deep to get that relief that will, I'm really bearing down and I'm out of wood here. And it's key to keep this wood loose so you can roll it around. If this was in a finished form, you couldn't really do the chip carving pattern very well. So I'm going to bring that all the way up and stop. And I'm coming back in here, mating again, because it has to go deep. You can see what that cut is right there. That's what I'm duplicating here. Now when I'm close and I need to go in to get the final detail, I go to the narrower blade like that. And that just lets me really get into the tight spots and pop it right out. And so the other thing that I like this smaller blade for, let me rotate that around, got to hold that angle, is when I do the serpentine lines like this, I'll, I'll show you on the outside edge of the shell, this is graceful. You lay in one cut using the edge of the scallop shell and you just trace out the pattern for this by using graphite paper or carbon paper if you can't find graphite paper and transfer it to the wood. And I will tell you there is one other little thing that's very important. When it comes time to get rid of the transferred pattern lines, if they are left, use an eraser. Don't sand it. If you sand it, what happens is you sand that stuff right into the pores of the grain and it contaminates your, your wood when you finish it. So those basic cuts are all you need in order to do shell carving that leads to this right here. And that will take about three hours right there. So it's worth it. Now let's go make that scallop top with three different hand planes. To me, for this box to work, the top has to be sculpted down like a roof, except it has to show some hand plane marks here. And I'm using the bench dogs in a tail vise on the bottom to hold on to this workpiece, just like that. And this is called a scrub plane. You can see that blade right there. It's got a curve to it. And Watch what happens when you skew it at about a 20 degree angle. You can really take the wood down. Now, if it chatters out, you have to reverse it because that's going against the grain. And so this is a wonderful way to add character to what would be a boring top otherwise. And then the other thing that I can do with that on the end grain that has a tendency to tear out, I can use a low angle block plane just to ease that edge a bit. I can do it on the top too. And then on the long flowing grain, going the length of the grain, I like to just shoot it with a number six just to make it more graceful. Of course, all of this stacks up just like this, and that looks awesome. And then what we have to do is fashion a top. So off to the drill press we go. This is Kentucky coffee tree, and that will be proud on the top since the lid just fits in, no hinges, we need this. And to make it, I'm using an inch and three quarter hole saw, no center pilot bit, and I have it clamped down. Watch what happens.
Now I'm all the way through to the sacrificial baseboard. And that gives me one curve on the outside. I'll drill out the center, then the far end, and then I'll take it to a bandsaw, cut the crest of that, bit of sanding, and then it's on to glue up at the main workbench. But I just have to line this up like that. This is so simple. And most folks don't think about using a hole saw. They'd go to a Forstner bit. Good luck getting a Forstner bit to behave when you're drilling off center like this. A spot of sanding, and look at that. Isn't that great? That gets screwed in from the bottom. And then a drop or two of glue on each one of the insides of the fingers. Uh, because what happens now is we're going to do the glue up. The channel in the bottom has to line up. So you swing this around like that, being careful so that you don't get squeeze out. So I'll bring up this side. The whole idea of doing a good glue up is you don't want any more squeeze out than you absolutely have to have. That's a solid piece of quarter inch walnut cut out at the table saw. You could use a band saw. I'll insert that into the groove. And you want just a little bit of wiggle room so it can expand and contract. Not a lot. And now this piece goes in like so. And once I get it all lined up, I clamp it, draw it tight, and let it be for half an hour. Of course, you have to hold your mouth just right to do all of that. OK. Now, what do you think of the, the treasure box? I love it. It's beautiful. I love all the different woods. and. Did a great job carving the shell. Thank you. Wayne would be proud. Yes, he would. <laughs> and yeah. I get the easy work. I get to see it come alive with this armor seal. It's an oil and urethane base. And you can brush it in, you can wipe it on. It's your favorite finish. It yeah. is. And you can do, usually I'll do about three coats. You can buff it in between if you need to. Okay. And then I need to. Do a little bit on I this. I love the top and the detail of the handle. That's Kentucky beautiful. Kentucky coffee tree. Uh, and when you do finishing work, the idea is get the brush charged with just the right amount of stuff so you don't get drips and runs. So let me brush that out like so. And I like the contrast. And I can't help it. I got to do the shell. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm jumping into the shell. So here we go. Cheated. <laughs> I listed her we took it to away do from all me. the hard stuff. Okay, but now. That is gorgeous. That's butternut. And I see walnut on the bottom. What's this on the side? Oh, uh, uh, Aripari, of course. You, you knew that from South America. No, I didn't. You didn't know that? I didn't. I can't lie. <laughs> but I remember in our Blaine, first house, beautiful. we had Kentucky coffee tree on our floors that we put in our very first house. You remember that? I do. Yeah. Now, let's set that down. That is gorgeous. Okay. Right on the painter's points there. There you go. That's good. Cool. And for the final moment, the truth, the moment of truth. <laughs> oh, heck yes. Wow, that is a treasure box. I think I need some special treasures to go in it. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. Okay, well, Give me that. onward. So that's it for this week, making a treasure box. I think it is worthy of something special for Susie, don't you? Yes, so, I do. Okay. What a great idea. Well, I'll <laughs> let you finish that and hope to see you next week in the American Woodshop. Yeah. Stay well. Yeah. Woodcraft, since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Pro Tools, for tool pros.
Rikon Tools. Woodcraft Magazine. Projects, plans, and web links designed to help you make wood work. P.S. Wood, home of Timberwolf Swedish Silicon Steel bandsaw blades and super sharp scroll saw blades. A bed to sleep on. A table to share meals. A house that feels like a home. The Furniture Bank of Central Ohio. Providing furniture to neighbors in need. For more information on tips behind the American Woodshop and watch free episodes 24-7, check us out online and like us on Facebook.